Well, praise the Lord and good morning to everyone in the house this morning and to those of you online. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why did Jesus have to die? That's my message this morning. Why did Jesus have to die? There are many people that are asking this question. And since I'm going through this series of why, there are people that are asking why. Why did he have to die? And I'm taking my text this morning from Romans chapter 3, 21 to 26, which gives us a specific <coughs> description of salvation. Salvation. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan was trying to explain, quote unquote, free salvation to a coal miner. But the man was unable to understand it. I have to pay for it, he kept arguing. So with a flash of divine insight, Dr. Morgan asked, how did you get into the mine this morning? Why? It was easy, the man replied. I just got on the elevator and went down. Then Morgan asked, wasn't that too easy? Did, didn't it cost you something? The man laughed, no, it didn't cost me anything. But it must have cost the owners of the company plenty to install that elevator. Then the man saw the truth. It doesn't cost me anything to be saved, but it cost God the life of his son. Amen. In this passage, I want us to look at the meaning of the atonement, why Jesus had to die. Folks, this is the heart of the gospel. You know, we're going to pull some scriptures or some verses from other parts of scripture because it is the most important doctrine in the whole of scripture. Why did Jesus have to die? It's what we believe. It's on a day in, day out basis. It's the heart of Christianity. And if you don't understand why Jesus Christ died for you, you don't understand Christianity at all. <coughs> so this morning, as I look at number one, false explanations. I hope I have it for you uh, on the overhead. There are some false explanations of the gospel. A couple of things that Jesus, first of all, did not die for. I always like to bring out the negative first because I don't want you to go home with the negative. So I want to nail that right at the top. Number one, Jesus Christ did not die by accident. Some people believe that. That it was an unforeseen experience, unplanned. That he quote unquote was the victim of circumstances. And nothing could be further from the truth. Scripture states very clearly that Jesus even predicted his own death. Many times he would say, I'm going to die. And he quoted Old Testament scriptures. That this was a plan of God. John 10, 17 to 18 said, No man takes my life, Jesus said, from me, but I lay it down. It wasn't an accident. Jesus Christ died not because he was forced to die, but the Romans may have thought that. You see, this is an interesting story. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, and a battalion of soldiers had come to get him, they asked where Jesus was. Jesus walked right up to them and said, I'm he. And they all fell backwards. A battalion now, no people, consists of 120 men. 120 men. Keep that figure in mind. They came to take him captive and they were so in awe that these men train in combat with their weapons on, their, all their guards, all of that, and they fell backwards in almost a fainting spell. There was so much power in the life of Jesus. 
Nobody took his life from him. He gave it up voluntarily. Number two, Jesus Christ died as a martyr. That's what, this is the, don't forget, the false explanations. He was a good man, and he died for his cause. He was a victim of a corrupt world, and he basically died for his principles. They say that he wasn't God, but he was just a good martyr, like Martin Luther King. Any person that you can name to be a martyr. The facts are very clear in Scripture that Jesus was actually God, not man. You see, his death was for a divine purpose. Now, Acts 2.23, in Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, This man who was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. It wasn't any surprise that God, to God, or to Jesus, that he came to die on the cross. He, he was not just a martyr, folks. Why did Jesus have to die? It was a necessity. You see, Jesus said many times, I must go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man must die. He must be lifted up. Meaning, above all people. If there could have been any other way for the salvation of the world, don't you think God would have used it? If there could have been any other place, sure and save his son from suffering that horrible death on the cross, there was no other way. You see, how do we explain that? Throughout history, great men have offered evidences or examples, illustrations of why Jesus actually had to die on the cross. And these explanations are technical theories of atonement. Big, long theories of atonement. They're true, each of them in their own way, but none of them are complete in themselves. You know, sometimes we can speak the truth, but it's not complete. It's a half truth, half lie. Come on, you folks know about that, or am I the only one? Okay, all right. All right, to understand why Jesus had to die, you have to look at all the explanations that the Bible gives. Not just one or the other. You've got to get the rest of the story. The death of Christ is so significant, so complex, you can't describe it in one phrase. There are many different explanations. We're going to look at five major ones this morning. Excuse me. <coughs> five major explanations of Christ's death. Number one, the ransom explanation. The main idea is that Jesus Christ paid a ransom to set us free. To have the hostages released in a hostage situation, you have to do something to get them released. You pay a ransom. This is what the Bible is talking about. Jesus Christ paid for our sin. The very first person who proposed this idea was a man named Origen. What a name, Origen, back in the third century. He said, Satan is in a war with God. He's taken all of humanity captive. We are, we are his prisoners of war. We are slaves to sin. We are hostages. We have been stolen from God. So Jesus Christ came to earth to exchange himself for us as a hostage. So Satan got Jesus and he thought that he had won. But little did he know 
the power of Jesus. Jesus exploded through death, came back to life, and the trick was on the devil. The penalty had been paid. Verses that deal with this, Mark chapter 10, 45 said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I said two weeks ago, and I say it again this morning, Jesus died on the cross for every person, but not everyone is saved. All right? He died for the whole world. But not all are saved or will be saved. It comes from blindness. From their eyes not being opened. We were set free when he came through that process. John 8, 36, 34 to 36 said, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Have you known anybody who has a habit that they can't break? That's being a slave to sin. Or a thought they could not get control of. <clears throat> a slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son belongs forever. So if the son sets you free... You are free indeed. <clears throat> Jesus set us free. This is called the ransom I did. Ephesians 1, 7 said, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. By giving his life on the cross, Christ purchased us from the slavery of sin. We have a present redemption in that he has delivered us from the penalty and the power of sin. <clears throat> and we shall have a future redemption. Now, when Christ delivers us from the presence of sin at his return, the Bible says what Jesus, that's what Jesus did. When he died on the cross, he paid the price. And it was stamped or marked, paid in full. Who did he pay the ransom to? One theory is he paid the ransom to the devil because the devil is the one who had the people hostage. Thank you. It could be a ransom paid in another way. For example, if I said to you, she paid a great price in bearing that child. Talking about labor pains. We as men don't know anything about it, so. <laughs> I'm talking to the men. Wouldn't it be absurd to say, who did she pay the price to? It's immaterial, right? It's immaterial if I said that. It just means that it was a great expense. Don't get hung up on who the ransom was paid to. This is simply a word picture that says it cost a lot for your salvation. Don't try to push the analogy of who I have to pay the cost to. It simply means that it cost Jesus a lot. Don't try to make it a payment to Satan. Because what happened to Satan, if that's true, Satan got ripped off. He got ripped off. Because Jesus paid, and then Jesus broke free from the bonds of sin and hell and death, and got loose. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So, Satan got ripped off, if that's the case. That we paid the ransom to Satan. It just means God paid a price for our salvation. That's one of the ways we can explain the death of Christ. Number two, moral influence. The key words in moral influence is love and example. 
This way of looking at why Jesus had to die is like this. Jesus Christ died to demonstrate God's love. Jesus Christ died as an example of God's graciousness. Jesus Christ died to show us how much God loves people and that he really cares. <clears throat> Jesus Christ died on the cross in order, this idea says, to soften people's hearts. And when you look at the cross, you're moved to compassion and you want to say, Lord, forgive me. Now I'm going to break that down for you. Because you see, what are you really looking at when you say this? Example. The, I, this idea comes from two incidences of people watching Jesus on the cross. Luke 23, 42, when you get a chance to read it. Jesus is on the cross, and one of the two thieves rejected Christ and made fun of him. The other became a believer on the cross. He was converted right then and there. It, is, it reads, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. <coughs> Jesus didn't preach a sermon to this guy. <coughs> For all that we know, this was the guy's first encounter <coughs> with the Lord Jesus Christ. But just by looking at Jesus on the cross, that man was moved to realize here was a man different from me. And he asked him to save him right from the cross. He was influenced right there on the cross. Another example in verse 47. Then the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Here's a guy who looks at Jesus from the foot of the cross. And he says, there's something different about this man. That's where the explanation comes from. You see, God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross as an example of his love for us. This example motivates us then and causes us to change. <clears throat> Is he an example? Sure. But I want to reveal to you this morning that speaking it from that point of view is only partial truth. It's a half of truth. Listen to the other part as I put it together. I know that I'm out there and I'm bringing some things to an end. But you see, sometimes we just say things, but there's no deeper meaning. And we are wondering why is some person confused because if that was the case, well then any other thing would be the case. So you can't just leave it there, out there, and not help people to understand. So I pray what I'm doing today is to help you to go deeper. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23, it says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus did not defend himself. Peter says, here's an example for you. 1 Peter 4. <clears throat> Therefore, since Christ suffered to, in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross as what? An example. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 said, Be imitators of God 
Therefore, as daily loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus Christ offered himself as a sacrifice and an example. Be an imitator. Philippians 2, 4 said, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Amen. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider himself equal as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being in human likeness, and being found an appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. We today as believers and as disciples are to have that same attitude. Amen. 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 So there's a legitimate reason for this approach. Jesus did die as an example of God's love. But there are some weaknesses with this. Some cautious, some, some cautions about this interpretation of the death on the cross. Number one, Jesus' death was more than just an example. Uh, the liberal theologians or theologians love to emphasize this viewpoint. They like to say Jesus was a great example of sacrificial love. It's full stop. That's it. But that does not take sin seriously enough. What, what this comes across as all we need is an example. And that is enough to make us do better. Could, would you say that, you know... Yeah. You got an example that's going to make you do better. No. I don't think so. No. So I need more than an example to do better. I know what I ought to do, Paul said. But I need the power to do it. Amen. I don't find a problem with knowing what to do. My problem is getting the power to do what I know I ought to do. So it is not enough just in an example. You see, reality also shows us that a lot of people know about Christ, but it doesn't affect them at all. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know him. I know God. I know about God. But it has no effect on their life. <clears throat> they continue to do what they want to do, right? Yeah. All right, so this view says, if you just talk about Jesus dying on the cross, it will naturally make people want to live godly, loving lives. Really? A lot of people know that Jesus died on the cross, but it has no effect on their lives. Something is weak about that statement. Another fact is that God has already shown his love many ways. He had already shown it in the Old Testament. So if at all Jesus' death did was to show that God loved us, it would be a waste. Let me explain. Because he had already shown in many ways that he loved us. He could have done it without such an expensive way of his own son dying on the cross. <clears throat> but Jesus is an example. Am I right? Amen. Number three. The victory example. Excuse me. This is often called the military viewpoint. Keywords, power, <coughs> triumph, and victory. The victory explanation of why Jesus had to die. History is a battleground. It's a battle between forces of good and evil. It's very similar to the ransom theory <clears throat> that says, that people says God paid Satan. Something that we don't need to hold on to. 
God didn't also, as I said before, Satan got ripped off if that's the case. Because Jesus was set free. But it goes further than that. The victory explanation basically said Jesus, when he died on the cross, guaranteed defeat of Satan. You see, destruction and doom is guaranteed for the devil. When that death took place, he neutralized the devil's power in our lives if we believe. This is a viewpoint that is shared by a lot of famous people, Martin Luther among them. Where does this viewpoint come from? Well, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. He's talking about Jesus actually becoming a human being. Now, let me ask you the question in the house this morning. <coughs> was Jesus half God and half man? No. He was 100% God. 100% man. You can't explain it. It's a miracle. It's like the Trinity. The person who denies the Trinity will lose his soul. The person who explains the Trinity will lose his mind. So that by his death, and I'm quoting scripture, he might destroy him who has the power of death. That is the devil. And free all those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. How many people do you know? This morning, right now, that fears death. <laughs> Many people you talk, they're fear of dying. Because they're being held captive. Amen. We're talking about the battle between the devil and the Lord. Jesus came to destroy the power of the devil and set people free. He didn't just pay a ransom. He came to devastate and annihilate the devil. You see, the devil is living on borrowed time. Did you know that? He already know that his time is over. He has read the book of Revelation too. You see, when you start getting up tight, read the book of Revelation. What is the theme of Revelation? The whole book teaches one thing. We win. We win. In the end of all your struggle, and all your things that we are going to go through in this life, we win Amen. when we trust Amen. the ever-living God. Amen? Amen. Amen? That's why it's such a comfort when John wrote it to the Christians who were being persecuted by Nero. They thought that Nero was the devil in the flesh. In fact, they thought that Nero was the Antichrist. Colossians 1.30 said, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son he loves in whom we have redemption what's redemption the forgiveness of sin we have been transferred from one kingdom to another that's the victory then triumph resurrection sunday easter God has devastated the enemy and delivered men from death to life, from darkness to light. Jesus has destroyed our ultimate enemy. Colossians 2.40 said, God has made you what? Alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us. And that stood opposed to us and took it away, doing what? Nailing it to the cross. The written code and its regulations was the law. All of the law of the Old Testament. The law that condemned us. We spoke before, the law hasn't saved anyone. It only points out that we can't make it on our own. Jesus took that law that condemned everyone 
He nailed it to the cross so that we can be free from that law. Verse 15 says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, <clears throat> triumphed over them by the cross. He's talking about spiritual beings. Satan, his legions, and his demons. He made a public spectacle. Satan thought that he had control when Jesus died. But oh, when he rose again, he realized, oops, I didn't see this one coming. <clears throat> I may know something, but I didn't know all things. Yes, enemy, we know that you don't. The early Christians made fun of the devil. They laughed at death. They thought Easter was a big joke on the devil. Can you imagine being a Pharisee? Putting Jesus Christ to death on the cross, and then a week later somebody comes up to you and says, Remember that guy you killed last weekend? He's alive. He wants to see you. <laughs> John 16 33 said be of good cheer I have overcome the world John 19 verse 30 said it is finished Jesus last words from the cross he did not say I am finished big difference folks he wasn't finished it is finished in other words the battle has been won where at the cross. Amen. At the cross. Satan's powers were smashed. Victory has been assured for those that trust in the Lord. He's a lion that roars, but his teeth are pulled out. And one day he's going to be totally destroyed. <clears throat> he's a borrowed time. And the power of Satan over your life is ineffective if you are a believer living for God. That's what the victory is all about. So, the last scripture given in this, it was 1 John 3, 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. So there's a war constantly going on between God and the devil. But read Revelation 17, 14. God wins. Devil loses. Number four, relationship. I'm coming home. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. <clears throat> All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The greatest ministry that we have, one to another, is reconciliation. Always constantly reconciling to each other. Because Jesus did it for us. He reconciled us to God. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and not counting men's sin against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. Once we have become right with God, your duty now is to go tell others. You know, get the message out. Don't keep it for yourself. God said he wants to be your friend. He wants to love you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. Tell it to someone. He doesn't want to have a barrier. He doesn't want to judge and condemn you. Jesus Christ took the condemnation on the cross. So he desires to be in harmony with you. He reconciles us. <coughs> Excuse me. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That means not only sharing the message, but helping people to get along 
with people. The principal concept is taught here. Ephesians 2, 12 to 16 says, We are separated from God, but Jesus brought us together. Colossians 1, 20 and 22 says, God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling us. The Bible also teaches that the Jews and Christians are reconciled together. This concept tells us that Jesus Christ died so that there could be a reconciling that takes place. What is the caution here? Caution? It's true. He brought us together. But like the others, incomplete. Got to add the other part. It doesn't explain how God can forgive sin and still be holy. You see, that's why we have to come to the last of these major explanations. This is the explanation that's taught. You can't just look at the cross and change your ways. There's got to be something that takes place. You can't just look at what Jesus did on the cross and said, okay, that's all. Jesus died for me. There has to be the next step. The process has to continue because the change in us has to take place inside. Amen. 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 Number five, the substitution explanation. Oh, the key words here, sacrifice and atonement. Verse 25, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. This is often called the legal explanation, the, 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 the penal code, if you want it to call it, the judicial explanation. It's in a courtroom. It's probably the most easy to understand and probably the one you're most familiar with. God is the judge, all have sinned. Wages of sin, death. Who deserves punishment? We do. We've broken God's law. Jesus Christ comes before the bar as our advocate and he says, they're guilty. They deserve to be punished. But I will take the punishment for them. I will be the substitute. I will take their place. I will serve out their term. The Bible says that's exactly what Jesus did. There are many proponents of this. It's the dominant theme of the New Testament. Hebrews 9.28 So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. He came the first time to die for our sins. And he died for many. In fact, he died for the whole world. One was the substitute for everyone else. Jesus was nailed to the cross, so you can stop nailing yourself to the cross. Jesus was hung on the cross, so you can stop hanging yourself. Jesus was condemned, so you can stop condemning yourself. He was a substitute. That has taken place. Now, your spiritual eyes have to be open to see the connection. 2 Corinthians 5.21 said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, sinless, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. <clears throat> One who deserves to die gets set free. Another who does not deserve to die takes the place. Galatians 3.13 said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming what? A curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. He took no condemnation. He's a substitute. He, sorry. He took our condemnation. He is the substitute. Every time you see 
and the Bible for us. That is the concept of substitution. God showed us love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. 1 John 2.2, 2, he is the atoning sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, get rid of all the old yeast so that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. Yeast in the Bible always refers to sin. Yeast infects, it puffs up. I love, in fact, I love yeast when it's put in dumplings. <laughs> Being an old Barbadian boy, that's how we used to do our bump dumplings till they come out. And they, you put them on steam and you just see them grow. That's what sin does. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up, pride puffs up, <coughs> sin puffs up. Yeast is always an example of sin. For Christ, our Passover lamb have been, has been Sacrifice. Remember Leviticus? On the Day of Atonement, two goats were selected. One goat was sacrificed for the entire nation. The other goat, they would lay hands. And the priest would symbolically <coughs> confess all the sins of the nation on that goat. And that's where the literal term scapegoat comes from. That one goat takes all the sin of the nation... Then that goat was taken out into the wilderness and set free to represent God forevermore. Here it says Jesus Christ was that lamb. He was that lamb. Jesus Christ is our substitute. I come at you this morning and I'm about close soon. What is the caution on this one, Pastor? Don't make it seem that God gets angry and Jesus intervenes. Because that's the concept some people have. God is angry at us and Jesus had to intervene. Some people would teach this in a way that would make you want to love Jesus but hate God. I heard the illustration one time of a guy trying to teach the substitution concept. He had a piece of glass and a hammer. The glass represented us and our sin. God represents the hammer. And he's getting ready to strike us in judgment. Just as he's about to bring the hammer down on the glass and smack Jesus Christ, a big hard pot, jumps in and covers us. So that the full force or the blow lands on Jesus. So the pot gets banged up but we are still, quote unquote, okay. There is the concept of the substitution, but if you take it to its logical conclusion, it's like the little boy who says, I love Jesus, but I don't like God. It makes God look like he's a vengeful God. He's wrath. But Christ trying to convince God don't hurt them. You have to remember that God is God, folks. Jesus, God. Full God. What's the matter of God saying, I'm going to beat you up and somebody coming in from the outside, a third party. It's more like God saying, somebody has to pay for this sin. I will. That's the proper cause. I stand in a place. <coughs> Not... I'm putting this thing to cover so that he can take. No. It says I'm standing in the place that you are. I paid your price, the penalty, because your wage, that wage was death. No third party involved here. When the substitution came, God said, I'll be the substitute. So, with these five concepts this morning, Jesus Christ set us free, he paid the ransom. 
Moral influence, the Bible teaches that God demonstrated his love by dying for us. Victory, Jesus Christ on the cross, smashed the power of the enemy. Relationship, God brought himself to us by sending his own dying son to be the mediator and to bring us together, to be the bridge. What then I ask you this morning should be our response. Once we understand why Jesus died and what should be our response. Number one, we ought to hate sin. Living as best we can in the power of the Spirit without sinning. Why should we hate sin? Look at what sin did to Jesus. If you want to know how bad sin is, look at the cross. Society teaches us to laugh at the fruits of our sin. You and I have grown up in an age in a society where a lot of things that we consider sin are being laughed at, being joked. We have comedians mm. on TV and we laugh along with them. The way society tries to get something to be acceptable, folks, is to laugh about it. I don't think it was any accident that a number of years ago, adultery started creeping into sitcoms before they were involved in dramas. And individuals started to laugh at it. It was a joke. It was a funny. It's not funny anymore, is it? If you laugh at something, you see, your resistance is lowered. If you begin to laugh, you know, at that kid that tells off his parent, and you say, oh, that's so cute, you laugh at it. Check that kid in a number of years. Sin is not a laughing martyr, folks. Look what it did to Jesus Christ. Number two, we ought to love Christ. When we look at what Jesus has done for us, it should break our hearts that we were the ones to pay the penalty and he stepped in and said, no, I'm paying the penalty for them. It should break our heart. He deserves our devotion. Why? 1 John 4, 9 and 10 said, We love him. Because why? He loved us. He gave himself for us. And because he loves us, we are to love him in return. Romans 8, 32. If God loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us, don't you think he loves you enough to care for all your other needs? Amen. 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 Folks, Jesus solved your biggest problem when he died for your sin. Any other problem you have is minor in comparison. If he loved you enough to take care of your sin, he loves you enough to take care of your needs. We ought to hate sin, love Christ. Christ. Last but not least. <clears throat> At least, we ought to make the message known. Can you imagine an event as important as the cross? Yet, it would be kept a secret. If somebody died for you, would you want others to know? If I had the cure of cancer or you had the cure of cancer, don't you think you'll be obligated to share that with others? The bottom line is, this is why we do what we do. Everybody deserves to hear what we are talking about. We don't require it to be kept in these four walls. We're going to shout it. We're going to put it on every stream, every concept, cell phone, computer, whatever permits us. And we put our funds behind it. So that it was outside of these four. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's a power to God for salvation. Amen. Amen. Church growth is not the concept of transferred growth. Oh, I know a Christian over here. 
I want you to come to my church. That, that's not church growth. Church growth is reaching the lost. If you were a believer before you came to Bethel, that's not the purpose of this church. It was not designed for, grow, for transferred growth. It was designed for thousands of people in the eastern townships that Jesus Christ died for, and they deserve to hear every single word that we talk about. It's the ultimate selfishness to say, we don't want to grow as a church. That's saying we are saved. We're comfortable. Within our four walls, we don't need to put it outside. That's selfish. What about everybody else? They need it just as much as we needed it. There are many of you sitting here this morning that said, hey, I'm thankful that somebody didn't stop within the four walls. <clears throat> Those people, if we don't reach them, who will? If nobody reaches them, if we do not use every tool to our advantage to proclaim the gospel of Christ, who is going to reach them? That's the question that I leave with you this morning. That is the response to the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. We hate sin because we see what it did to Jesus. And we see what sin does to people. We love Christ. We share that message. And that means outreach, evangelism is our number one priority. I'm going to close there this morning. Let me just give this one thought. Just hold a thought. God is more happy when one person becomes a believer than seeing 99 in fellowship. Do you know that? Amen. One. I close this one.